Hi, my name is Ratna Viewer, and I'm talking to you from Auckland, New Zealand, via the webcam on my laptop. And I'm going to share some reflections on the eight worldly winds during the midst of this international urban retreat. And rather than have you just look at me for the next uh, seven or eight minutes, I thought I would use some images and some words. So here goes. So we are all familiar with the eight worldly winds, and the problem is not with these conditions of life per se, but with our relationship to them. <clears throat> Difficulties arise when we base our happiness on having or not having them in our life, steering towards some and away from others, elated with pleasure and despairing with pain. But does this work as a strategy for living a fulfilling life? Well, maybe for a little while, um, but I don't think it does. Like all conditioned phenomena, these eight worldly winds are like a shadow. They're not substantial. They're subject to change. They're like lightning. They're fleeting and impermanent. They're like dew with the rising sun. They evaporate before our eyes. There in the morning, gone by midday. And as we try to hold on to them or keep them at bay, our happiness becomes bound up with their presence or absence. So are the worldly winds bound up with our dissatisfaction? Well, in Western culture, we listen to advertising mantras and sermons on consumerism. And these sermons encourage us to see ourselves as lacking, of less than, of falling short or broken. And these sermons encourage us to chase after, to fill the hollows, always filling, always chasing. These sermons, these mantras tell us that something, there's something more to be held, something better to be tasted, and something new to be touched. They're restless mantras of more and better. They're anxious mantras of avoiding loss, avoiding less than. But do these mantras work? Do they lead to our happiness? Or do they lead to our affliction? And I don't think we need to look very far to find an answer to that. Um, our hearts and our minds find no rest in today's world. So perhaps I'm preaching to the converted, but I think it's worth repeated reflection. How much is enough? And there's a great poem by Ryokin like to read out. My hut lies in the middle of a dense forest. Every year the green ivy grows longer. No news of the affairs of men, only the occasional song of a woodcutter. The sun shines and I mend my robe. When the moon comes out, I read Buddhist poems. I have nothing to report, my friends. If you want to find the meaning, Stop chasing after so many things. So before his enlightenment, the Buddha reflected on two types of thought, two inclinations of his heart. And he asked himself whether or not inclinations of his mind imbued with craving, aversion, and harmfulness inclinations of his heart imbued with craving, aversion, and harmfulness, do they lead to his own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both himself and others? And he saw that they did. And when he reflected in this way, when he placed his heart upon this direct awareness that inclinations imbued with these qualities lead to his own affliction or to the affliction of others 
or to the affliction of both himself and others. These inclinations imbued with craving, aversion, and harmfulness began to subside. Complementary to this, when he brought his heart's awareness to inclinations imbued with generosity and renunciation, care, goodwill, and harmlessness, he saw that these did not contribute to his own affliction, nor to the affliction of others, nor to the affliction of both himself and others. And then he knew, <clears throat> excuse me, and then he knew for himself that these inclinations cause no difficulties. They are an aid to his wisdom and are not to be feared. So we start to change the momentum of the world by changing the momentum in ourselves, by not chasing after so many things. So I've been practicing Buddhism for almost 20 years now, and there are two gifts that it has given me that really stand out in my mind, which I'm really grateful for. One of these is meditation, a practical tool for cultivating greater awareness and a kinder, more caring heart. And the second is friendship. Or perhaps I should say a greater ability to be a friend along with the fruits of such skills. So if we allow the worldly winds to blow us around I think one of the things we lose is the potential for deeper and more meaningful friendships. True friendship is not tied up with these worldly winds. So for example, if we base our relationships with other people on receiving praise and avoiding blame, we will never enjoy the deeper, more meaningful communication which can accompany true friendships. And I always feel that my friendships are going deeper when people start to see all the different sides of me, both my potentials and my challenges. Fair weather friendships that are based around profits and pleasures, which dry up during difficulties and loss. Well, would any of us really call these friendships? So navigating life by the worldly winds does not allow human relationships to be as meaningful as they could be. And interestingly enough, when we have good friends, when we have meaningful friendships, we've already taken the first step onto the spiritual life. But practicing Buddhism does not mean that I no longer experience the worldly winds. Obviously, as we've talked about, the worldly winds are conditions of life. They're inseparable from life. So I still enjoy watching my nieces play. I still appreciate the affections of my grandmother. And I still grieve when friends and family die. I don't practice Buddhism to find pleasure and avoid pain, nor do I practice Buddhism to avoid pleasure and seek out pain. That would be really silly. Instead, I try to practice generosity, contentment, and simplicity. I try to practice kindness and goodwill. I try to practice honesty, mindfulness, and compassion. I practice being less enchanted by both pleasures and pains. I try to see them as they really are, insubstantial, subject to change, not something I can hold on to, not something I can avoid. And then, when I practice in this way, I find that desirable experiences do not lose their pleasure. Instead, I simply loosen my imperative to have them and hold on to them. They are not so tightly bound up with my happiness. 
Similarly, I find that undesirable experiences do not lose their pain nor their difficulty. Instead, I loosen my resistance to them. The need to avoid them is not so tightly bound up with my happiness. And what rises up within when I quit chasing or avoiding life? That's what's really special. Because what rises up is a heart, a mind, that's unruffled by the pains and pleasures of living. It's a mind, a heart, that's alive to the depth and breadth of life, not picking and choosing. So I'd like to read one more poem by Ryokin to finish this offering. The number of days since I left the world and entrusted myself to heaven is long forgotten. Yesterday, sitting peacefully in the green mountains. This morning, playing with the village children. My robe is full of patches, and I cannot remember how long I have had the same bowl for begging. On clear nights, I walk with my staff and chant poems. Who says many cannot lead such a life? Just follow my example.